Jeff, what's going on, man? Welcome to the Dad Edge. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'm excited to be here. Uh, Listen to your podcast a few times, and and I, you know, I I I posted something like a week ago, like or maybe beginning of this week. Excited to go on the podcast, and a bunch of people from First Form reached out to me because I'm a First Form athlete, and they were like, "Oh, I love him. I love him." And I think one one of the guys who's like one of my coaches there was like, "I just talked to him an hour ago," and I was like, "All right, let's go." Who's, who's your coach? Uh, Nick Clements. That is crazy, man. Yeah. I, I literally just got a text from Nick right before we, uh, oh, that's hilarious. Did. That's awesome. He's a great, great guy. He's helped me a lot with, you know, learning how to, how to help people help themselves more with like yeah. the supplements that they, they offer and stuff. He's a good dude. Yeah, man. He, uh, I'm with you. I, I just, we just signed with them. Uh, we're, we're Congrats. thank you. We are the, we are officially the first, we are officially the first podcast partner, our first forum. Wow. Know, that's man, right? unreal. Welcome to the fam, man. Right. Right. Exactly. I told Sal, I was like, dude, it only took you 20 years, man. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I just had Sal as we're recording this. I just had Sal on the podcast this past week. And, uh, he actually approached, approached me and, uh, was like, Hey man, like, you know, we haven't, we've never partnered with a podcast before, you know, we're looking for good people. And he's like, my interest is not, you know, partnering with the masses, but partnering like, like yourself, right. Like with good, like-minded, good hearted people. He's like, and, and we'd like to partner with, we, and I'm like, dude, I was like, that's a no brainer for me. I was like, I truly believe in the supplements. I've been taking them for literally 20 years. I still remember, I don't know if you remember this or not, but I still remember when, uh, Atilio's supplements was Atilio supplements off mid rivers. And then, uh, Andy bought it. And I remember when that happened, because one of my buddies was, we used to come home from college just to buy supplements at Atilio's cause it was less expensive. And, uh, he's like, Hey man, you know, Atilio's got bought out. You should, you should check it out and went in there. And that was the first time I, I actually, I met Andy in there. Like when he was like, Wow. Not Andy now. Yeah. You right? use Andy then. Right. Uh, even the old logo, like the old sign, you know, that they had back in the day, man. So it goes back a minute. That's pretty cool. Oh, that's so cool. I love, I love everything about St. Louis for, for many reasons. I love supporting any St. Louis company that I can, that does things the right way. And that I believe in, because when I was growing up, um, I'm an 85 birth year. I just turned 37 a few weeks ago and uh, teams refused to come and play us here in St. Louis, like literally at the yes. AAA level. Yeah. Swear to God. I didn't they, know that. We, we were in a league called the Michigan national hockey league, MNHL. It was with all the best AAA teams from around the country. And they said, okay, St. Louis, you guys can be in the league, but we refuse to travel to you. You have to travel every weekend. So from seventh grade until I, I left St. Louis after my freshman year of high school to, to play elsewhere, uh, I, I had to travel, I'd say like 95% of the weekends during the hockey season because we could barely get any teams to come down here. And for league games, teams refused to come down here. So I have, so a, I have a lot. Uh, they just thought we weren't good enough, which, which is hilarious because our team wound up having more division one scholarships probably than any team St. Louis has had maybe ever. I don't know. Um, definitely up there in the top couple. And, uh, and it really helped to put, put St. Louis hockey on the map for sure back then. So I have a lot of pride in St. Louis. And I love like doing anything I can to help St. Louis. So, um, I used to be with a different supp supplement company. Uh, so when I had the opportunity to switch to first form, I, I took it immediately. I was, I was really excited. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. You know, that, that's really cool to hear, man. I can't even tell you, um, I'm the, I'm in the same boat you are, um, meaning that we've, I have had so many supplement companies that have asked to be a part of the brand and, and the podcast. And I have told them absolutely not. I mean, dude, I've had generic Viagra vendors come out and be like, Hey, <laughs> like, no, we're good. Thanks though. <laughs> Nothing against guys who use that, but like, right, I'm, right, I'm, right. I'm not, I'm not doing that. And yeah, we, we've had, and I, I won't mention any companies or any names, but I'm just like, and, and you know, that the quality of the supplements that are behind some of these companies, you're like, eh, Mm, I don't really feel comfortable talking about that on the podcast. Like I don't, right. I don't, take it, I don't even take it myself. Right. So um, I've always been a big proponent of, I will only promote what I truly, truly believe in and what I do on a regular basis. And I've been, been taking first form supplements since literally like, Oh my God, man, 1999. 
Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, That's awesome. I I remember going to S2 in Chesterfield Valley, like the, like right when it opened and I was there all the time. And, um, even when I was with an, a, a different supplement company, uh, I would go into S2 and I would have uh, workers from the S2s come to my gym and train with me for free just so like I could like say thank you to those guys because I would always send my clients uh, to S2 in Chesterfield because they were knowledgeable, they were yeah. approachable, they weren't trying to like just shove products down my guys throats because i'd tell them what i wanted them to take hey go in there i want you to get this this and this if you have questions ask the guys they are super knowledgeable and they all have to be certified which i loved and they just do it better like i don't did you ever go to gnc back in the day you'd go in there and they would just try and they would just try and like line stuff your pockets with stuff you didn't want and i'm like dude this isn't what i'm about here right no that's that's the funny thing like that's why me and one of my buddies from college, like there was a mall, like I went to Southeast Missouri state and there was a mall that was, you know, really obviously in town. And there was, and then there was a, at that point in time in the, in the mid nineties, late nineties, there was a GNC in every mall. So we would go there, but like when you're on a college budget, man, you were like, Oh my God, like this stuff is going to break the bank. And, um, I, yeah, I never forget like coming home and we would, me and my buddies, we would be like, you know, Hey, let's, let's all go to Atilio's, you know, they've got good, good supplements. And then when they were taken over by S2, not much really changed, you know, the high, the high quality was there. And, but the, but the knowledge was always that they were always so welcoming coming in. And even now, like I, I, I was telling Sal this, like, I was like, if I'm in an area, like if I'm in Wentzville, like on the parkway, or if I'm in Chesterfield Valley, like I'll find an excuse to almost go in there sometimes just to grab like a bar or something like that. And every time I go in there, I told him, I was like, I don't know how you people do it. I don't know if there's like a, like a person, like videoing and recording things, but somehow, some way your people remember the conversation that I had with them 30 days ago. And they asked me like, Hey, how'd your son do in that football game? And I'm like, I just kind of look at him like, dude, how in the hell do you remember that? Like it's, it blows my mind. They're, they're, you know, they say it all the time. They're in the people business, you know? And yeah, I, yeah. I love that. They're not just about like elite athletes. Like they're about helping everyone, which I think is, is really, really cool. And, um, they just do things right with like the culture. Like I, obviously I was a pro athlete for 10 years. I was the captain of a college division one team. Um, you know, I went to school there for three years and like everything in sp- pro sports, elite sports, college sports, all about culture. And like, they just do it so well. They, they, they have an unmatched culture. And I feel like, like, it sounds like cheesy, but like, I just feel like I'm back playing. I feel like I'm home when I'm around those types of people, because it's a very similar mindset and, uh, and the drive that they all have. And that's, that's a big draw for me, for sure. I agree, man. It really is. I, I heard this statement that uh, culture will eat vision for breakfast every day of the week. Ooh, so you better have your culture in check. Right. I like, that. but, um, but listen, you know, Hey, this show is all about you. And, uh, I want to start out with, obviously you, you've done some amazing things and we're going to go in a couple different avenues on this particular show. Uh, but I, I really want to start with, um, I love digging into the childhood and to the mindset of someone who was a pro athlete, because that's like, when you're like a little kid, you know, going out there on the ice for the first time, it's like a dream, right? Huge dream to go out there, but it's another thing to live it and do it. But I want to start with your childhood and what that was like for you. Yeah, it was awesome. I mean, I, I, I have amazing parents. My dad's an entrepreneur, so I saw him grind. And I think that's, that's one of the biggest influences on me in my hockey career was seeing him being an entrepreneur and owning his own company for all that I can remember of my life. Um, and, and they were just very supportive of me, but in a little bit different way than uh, maybe the word's not supportive now, but like now a lot of parents, I, I see them like intervening too much in their, in their kids sporting career. My parents were like, okay, you say you want to play more or okay. You, you say you want to get better but you go talk to the coach, you go ask, what do you need to work on? We will not call the coach for you. My parents never called any of my coaches. Um, And so that was, that was like really, really big for me and really important when I look back and I didn't even know how important it was. And I'm so grateful and thankful they did that. But, but like I said, they were extremely supportive. You know, if I needed to go to a camp or I needed to go do workouts, you know, they were like, well, we'll pay for it as long as you give your all, as long as you are really going there to get better. Like you're not going there to mess around. Like we will, we will do that. And so, um, I had a great childhood, uh, through my hockey career, there was lots of highs and lows. And, and I think this is a big thing in sports 
and it teaches kids. This is why I love all sports, especially hockey is like, it, it teaches you responsibility to be consistent in the game. And if you're trying to continue up levels, consistency is one of the biggest things that you have to have to keep going up in any sport, um, just like in life. And so in hockey, I think a lot of youth hockey players struggle with that. And that was one of my challenges. You know, one year I'd be the best on the team and next year I'd be in the middle of the pack and kind of going like this until um, the first year I made AAA hockey for the St. Louis AAA Blues was seventh grade. Now, it starts crazy young, like stupid young. Now AAA might start in like fourth grade. I don't even know. It's, it's wild. Um, but I, I played like one to two shifts a game, like not a period, like a game. And I remember being so distraught and so upset because I came from a double A club where I was one of the better players and I, I go up level and I'm I'm not good enough to be at that level yet. And uh, my parents, again, the, all right, you need to ask coach, bring a notebook, take notes. What does he say? Now you go work on whatever he says. And so that first summer from seventh into eighth grade was when I learned to really invest in myself. I went to the rink every day. My mom. Mom um, worked uh, administration for a junior team here in St. Louis called the St. Louis Sting. Um, so I got free ice. So I would just go and I, there was no yeah. skills. Co- yeah, there was no skills coaches back then. There, there wasn't like camps going on in St. Louis back then, really, unless they came from out of town. So I would just go and do like the, the things that the coaches told me to work on and uh, immediately saw an impact that next year. I went from the 12th forward to probably like the sixth. Wow. Wow. Open my eyes. Okay. Like me working harder than everybody else. And when everybody else is at the pool all week, like, and I'm doing stuff to get better, it, it really helped me. And it just opened my eyes to like personal development and growth. And from that summer, seventh grade, going into eighth grade summer until I retired at 32, all I did was like, try to find ways to get better. And, and I had to, to, to be relevant and to keep going up. But like, that's, that was my purpose in life. Just find ways to get better. All right. So I've got a couple of questions for you. I, I love, I love how you, I love how you're taking us through the journey of, I was, I was really, really good. And then I was in this season where then I was with a new team where I was middle of the pack and then I was really good. And listen, that's one of the hardest things for not only a youth athlete for, but for a human being to get through. Uh, and I I've seen, I've seen my own son go through this. He's actually in a transition right now where, um, <laughs> it's, it's fascinating to me, man. He's been playing football since he's been in third grade and loves the game more than anything. And in eighth, he's 145 pounds, but he's strong as a damn ox. Like, and when I say strong as an ox, like he can plow through me, I'm 165 pounds. Like I'm, I'm nothing. And he can plow through kids who are well above 200, like nothing. And in his eighth grade year, he was on the offensive line and it became like, kind of a, of an aesthetic, like a visual joke, because like the, his offensive line, except for him outweighed him by 40, 50, 60 pounds. Wow. I mean, these kids were well over 200, 200 pounds and the kids he would go up against, like some of the teams, I'm like, there's no, I, I'd, I'd be in the stands. And I'm like, Oh my God, there's, there's, I'd see the kid across from him. I'm like, there's no way that he's going to get crushed. And somehow, some way, man, Mason would just like plow through these kids. And it was awesome to see that. And so then he makes it to freshman year this year. Right. And he's on the football team and the coach asks him, he's like, so he was like, what, what position do you play? He's like oh, on the offensive line. And the coach goes, not here. You're not. And he's like, you're not big enough. And he's like, I'm strong. He's like, nope. He's like, we're, and so basically what he had to do was, is uh, reinvent himself. So now he's a first string linebacker. And now he's the second string quarterback, which he's never played quarterback before. He's like, let me see you throw the ball though. And he threw the ball and he's like, huh kind of coached him up a little bit. And now he is the second string quarterback, but he had to all summer long, kind of like you all summer long. He took that very seriously. He's like, dad, like I have, I have two new positions. Like I'm really nervous about it. Like I've been on the offensive line for three, for three years. And I'm like, what are you going to do about it? And this kid, man, I did not have to push him to camp. He went to camp every day. Then he would self-organize in the afternoons, like he'd get 10 of his buddies, they go back up to the high school and then they play, he'd get those reps in those reps. in, and then he's like, Hey, can you hire me a QB coach? I, I need to learn how to throw properly. Hired him a QB coach. He got up to the point where I literally at some points I'm like, dude, you have to take a rest day. Like you're, you're pulling double duty every day. You're going to wear your body down. I was like, just, you know, 
tone it down maybe on like a Sunday or something. Right. And he's like, no, I got to go back. I got to keep going. But I love that mentality, but there's a, there's the, the, the reason I want to share that story is because whenever you're an athlete and it doesn't matter if you're an athlete or just in the, in, in the world alone in lifetime itself, when it comes to this type of thing where you're suddenly thrusted either into a whole new arena of people that now you're competing very, very differently against some people will crumble and be like, you know what? I guess I wasn't that good after all. And I'm just, I'm just done. And then some people will be like, hell no, I'm going to rise to this occasion. I'm going to do extra work. I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to get the ice time that I need. I'm going to get out there and freaking get after it. But that's a mentality that some people don't have. So looking back on that mentality, even as a kid, what was going on for you? Um, it's a great question. Uh, multiple things. I mean, one, like I just, I loved hockey. I wanted to be a hockey player. I, I knew that what I was doing, whatever I was doing at that time, wasn't getting me the results I wanted. Like, obviously I know even in seventh grade, if I'm the 12th forward, like that's, I'm not gonna be able to keep moving up at some point if I'm that last player on the team, you know what I mean? Um, so I knew that for my goals, something has to change or else I'm not going to reach, you know, playing pro hockey or getting to juniors or getting to college hockey, getting a scholarship. Um, so that, that was something, but, but again, like my, my dad, so he was the president of the Missouri refs association for like 10 years. Yeah. Um, he, uh, he refed world juniors in Finland. He refed professional hockey, college hockey, all of this while he was running his own business. That was pretty much only him. And like this dude grinded, like he would come home. He traveled a lot more when I was really young, but I just remember when I was young, him coming home on like a Friday night at like 7 30 PM. And he'd be up at like four or 5 AM on Saturday morning, doing work for the next week. And then when he got that done, he would be doing stuff around the house to make sure the house was the way that it needed to be and making sure the cars were there. And I have no idea where this guy got his will or his energy to do everything he did for our family. And on top of that, I also say my mom did all the stuff like for my sister and I. So then she's doing everything for us, too. And, and they both just were such, such, such hard workers. They never complained about anything. Anytime there was a situation where something was hard, they like found a way they felt, you know, and we didn't have a hard life. Like, I'm not trying to make it sound like that. We had a great life, you know, middle class, upper middle class. I don't, yeah, I don't even know what the distinctions are. Um, oh, but yeah. like they, er but they earned it. Like they yeah. earned it. It wasn't given to them. It wasn't passed down to them through the family by any means whatsoever. Neither of them grew up with, you know, silver spoon by any means they earned it. And so I just think that, you know, from the talks of my dad, my, my dad's only advice my whole hockey career we never really talked about like uh x's and o's in hockey and he never reprimanded me or anything other than you better work as hard as you can like that's that's just the staple always work as hard as you can but my dad's only advice whether i was a kid i was in juniors i was in college i was in pro was hard work patience more hard work and like if things aren't going your way hard work be patient while you're working hard and then work harder. And, and so like, I just always say that to myself and um, you know, now I look back and I had a very strong why, and this is something that it's, I have it hand painted uh, in my gym from a street artist from downtown. It says, what is your why? And mm -hmm. every it's massive, right, like right in the middle of my gym and every day guys come in and we do intention setting before every single training session, make them lay down, close their eyes for two to three minutes. They set their intentions, short-term goals, long-term goals, and then visualization, seeing themselves achieve those goals and what they need to do like today, tomorrow on the ice and stuff to get better. And I just like started to do all that stuff when I was younger out of necessity I just wasn't good enough. So I had to like, keep finding these ways to get better. And for me, if you have a strong why, then you'll find a way to get better, to get closer to your goals. I think a lot of people, they, they, they have a goal, but they don't like define their why they don't d define why they're going to the gym. So like, not everybody likes working out. I totally get that. But if you want to be a pro hockey player, you, you have to work out in some way or another, whatever your training philosophy is of your coach or whatever, but you've got to go in there and you've got to tell yourself, I'm going to give my everything to this training session. 
because I want to be a pro hockey player. I have to do this as good as I can because it's going to make me better out there. That is a strong why. So for me, defining your why has to be individualized and you have it has to be so strong that it's going to help you to overcome the setbacks and all those types of things. Man, I love that. Uh, having a strong why I think is, is foundational. You mm-hmm. have to figure out like, what, why are you doing what you're doing? You know, a lot of guys ask me, they're like, why do you do the dad edge? And so <laughs> this is This might surprise you or somebody else that listening, but, uh, I do it because I need it the most. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean I'm, I'm raising four boys and I, I, I came from a background that was absolutely crazy. I mean, um, you know, my father, but I actually, I actually didn't even meet him until I was 30. That's, that's how our story kind of came to be. And I, I was, um, my childhood was like just absolute craziness with it. When it came to father figures, my mom was constantly in and out of marriages and boyfriends and toxicity. And so when I became a father, man, I was like, I don't know what I'm doing, but, but my why was like, I have to do this right because I know what it feels like when it's wrong. And right. that's a, but, but here's the other cool thing too. Uh, not only did your dad, we, I say, I've been saying this quote a lot, and I think it really holds true to what you saw growing up. The best lessons in life are caught, not taught. And you said two or three times now that you watched your dad work really hard, right? So your dad wasn't sitting on the couch, like doing nothing and saying, Hey man, work hard, be patient, work hard, be patient. You saw your dad work hard, right? So what, what what was that like? I mean, looking back on it now, I mean, I'm, I, I think it's safe to say that we don't appreciate that stuff when we're kids. Cause it's just kind of, it becomes the norms. Like, Oh yeah, dad works his ass office. But, but looking back on it now, what are some things that you most admire about watching that work ethic come to fruition? Well, first of all, he never complained, like never. And, and you know, did he have to work as hard as he did? You know, like, I, I you know, I don't know. Um, but like, if something came his way, if something happened, something broke, like, does it, doesn't matter. He, he slept two hours. It was just like, if something needed to be done, he's going to do it every time. No, I don't know if I've ever heard him come like he jokes, but like, I've never heard him actually complain about anything for real. If there's a problem, he's just like, okay, we're going to solve, like, we're going to do it. He just, just puts on his work boots and he does it. And that was really, really, really important. I, you know, looking back because going through your journey of, of, you know, the sporting world at the elite levels, whether it's like, you know, youth or, or as you go towards the college ranks. And if you're lucky enough to get to the pro ranks, you're going to hit so many roadblocks, like so many, and it doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't mean if you're the best player ever, there's, there's peaks, there's valleys, there's good seasons, there's bad seasons, there's slumps within seasons, there's injuries where maybe you have to play through and you're not able to play at your full capacity. Um, and then that starts to play with your mind. Cause that will affect your numbers, which affects how you get paid, you know, but that's not an excuse because there's no excuses in pro sports. It's you, you produce or you don't have a job next year. And, and that, that approach that my dad took to life and just doing everything, it was, it was so, you know, it was so demonstrative. I just saw it every single day. He just, he just lived it, you know? Um, and then on top of that too, he, he has a massive heart as well as my mom and they both were so charitable but never the kind of people to like talk about it. Like I, I'd find out years later that, that, you know, they paid for like so many other kids who couldn't afford to play triple a hockey. And back then it was nowhere near as expensive as it is now. Um, but there were multiple years where I found out later that they helped pay for my teammates, but they wouldn't let the club tell the, the family that they helped pay for them, you know? And so it's just like, you know, I found that out later and I'm like, wow, like, my dad just was always giving back. Like when he was president of the reps association, he'd hold tons of different meetings to help people pass the test so that they could ref and make money doing that stuff. And, you know, my parents were both just leaders. They get, they get stuff done. I, I, you know, I believe they do it in the right way with the right heart. And, uh, and like you said, it's just really important. And I've learned that through, I'm, I was a captain on almost every team I played on uh, everywhere in, in, the U S in, in juniors in college, they named me the captain unanimously as a sophomore, which almost never wow. happens Okay, uh, right there. Almost That's never cool. happens. Um, 
And it was mainly because I just liked helping all. I pushed myself so hard and held myself to such a high standard because I held everyone else to a super high standard around me, which then forced me to be at an even higher standard. And it was just kind of like this, this push and then pulling myself, pushing others, which pulled myself further. And I learned that when I put myself out there and push other people, well, if I'm going to do that, I, be, I better be walking the walk too. Yeah. And, uh, and so that really helped me in my career. And I, I saw my dad helping others. And I kind of, I guess, probably just started doing that more. And then I realized well, when I, if I'm going to stand up and say something and hold someone accountable, like I better have my own backyard cleaned up, you know, and, and that really, really, really helped me in my career without that mindset, without the mindset I had to get better. There is 0% chance I would have gotten a scholarship, let alone play 10 years of hockey all over the world professionally. Yeah. It's unreal, man. Uh, and I, I want to get to that, um, to the, to that area of your life. Uh, first of all, I just want to recap. I just want to make sure that everybody heard that like, gentlemen, listen, if you don't think that your job as a father and as a leader and the lessons that you're teaching are caught, not taught, this is what Jeff is laying out for us here is a perfect example, right? Your kids are watching. You're, you're a walking, talking movie to your kids and they're picking up everything, whether they tell you or not. And here Jeff is right. 30 plus years later talking about his, the, his work ethic of his dad. I also love the, re the resilience of your dad. Like the yeah. fact that he didn't like, if there was a problem, he's like, Hey, we're just going to solve it. I didn't complain yeah. about it. Just did it, which I love that. And I also like the fact that he did not get involved with the coaches. Like, and to be quite honest, right. To be quite honest, like the guy is president of like, you know, the referee organization, he probably could have made a few phone calls if he really wanted to, but he didn't. Right. He made, made you work at it, which I think is great. I, I have, I have the exact same approach with, with my boys, you know, it's so it's so massive. I played with so many guys growing up in St. Louis and even past that, um, who are way better than me at hockey. Yeah. And, you know, I, I look back now and I can reflect and we do this all the time on our podcast and, and, the, the parents who always were intervening, always talking to the coach, why is, why is so-and-so sitting? Why isn't so-and-so on the power play and not making their kids go and have those tough conversations. One, literally none of those players quote unquote made it, or, or I, I like to use made it as a different term because mo yeah, there's so many things that have to fall into place for you to be a pro athlete, even to make it to division one, there's so many different things. Like, you know, you got genetics, you, you've got, you've got your background, your mentality, your actual skills. You have all these different things. Some you control, some you can't, and it's very hard to make it, but all these players who are better than me, whose parents were the helicopter parents, literally zero of them maximize their abilities, yep. whatever their ceiling would have been. None of them reached it. None of them. And, and, you know, through my, through my now coaching, you know, you know, 10 to 15 years now in different capacities with my own company or coaching in the summers, when I'd come back during my career and help out, you know, the local organizations and stuff, I'd see that stuff too. And it, it, the, the helicopter parents, like their kids, they're not the same. They, they grow up differently. You know, I've had the chance to see that a bunch of kids, you know, when they were like eight, nine, 10, and then just kind of watch their careers and them grow as people. And now they're in college and things like that in mid twenties. And, and it's a big difference. The parents who, and it almost, it almost looked like, um, their parents were like a little bit more standoffish because it was all like, well, you talk to the coach, you go ask about a nutrition talk, you go do this versus the parents who are always around. And it's the kids who were forced to be a little bit more self-starters and self-reliant. Those are the kids who are the go-getters later in life and are, and are on the whole, in my experience, reflecting on all these years are, are more successful and, and maximizing more of their abilities. I agree with you, man. Um, quick story to reflect on that. Uh, my son's football coach since he was in third grade is one of my best friends. He's also my workout partner. He has been for years. And um, the thing that I've always done though, is I've always, I've always held that boundary very tight. Um, I purposely would not talk about Mason's football performance or anything like that, unless he would come and talk to me about it. And I think every now and again, you know, he would, he would voice, you know, certain things about Mason. And then my question back to him is, well, what is, what do you think Mason needs to work on? And then he would tell me, and that was it. End of conversation. 
but it was never brought up. I could probably count on one hand in five years, how many times we talked about Mason. And there were times where Mason would be going through something. He'd be like, Hey, you know, and me and his, his coach Vito, we would work out together every morning. He's like, Hey, can you talk to Vito about that tomorrow? I'm like, Nope, I will Love not. That. Yeah, I will not. You go talk to him about it. Your practice yes. tonight, you talk to him about it. And he'd be like, well, you see him in the morning. You see him every morning. You guys are best. I was like, it's not my job. I was like, don't put me in that position either. I was like, he's my friend. I'm not doing that. I was like, you do that. And I, I was very stern with that. It was black and white. I was like, there's no favors, man. Yeah, we work out together. Yes, we're friends. But I, I am not going to nudge, nudge, wink, wink, play my kid. No, never, ever. I was like, because man, listen, I was like, sooner or later, you're gonna be in high school. And now he's in high school. I was like, I don't know those coaches. And I'm, I'm sure it's not going to go talk to them either. I was like, you, if you want to play more, you want something more, you either got to voice it or show it. And that's what he would do. And I'm, I'm glad I made that decision. The, The weird thing is that it's, it's very refreshing talking to you about this because I kind of did it more from a selfish standpoint because I didn't want to put my friend in that position. And as a byproduct, I'm like, I'm probably doing my kid a lot of favors here by making him do the work, but I didn't really actually understand it from a kid perspective until. Right. I, about it. I think that's where like mentorship from, from athletes that, you know, again, quote unquote, made it, whatever that means in your sport or, or at least maximized their ability and made it further than everybody probably thought they would have. I think it's really important to come back and give back to whatever sport you played um, and, and help athletes with this stuff, because it, it's scary going to talk to a coach when you're in seventh grade, eighth sure. grade, especially if you think they don't like you or they're, you're the right. last forward, or you're the, you're the third running back out of three, whatever it is. And so that's where mentorship is really, really helpful to be like, well, here's an idea. And like something I tell all my players and, you know, there's a lot of dads listening. So I'm sure they have a lot of similar situations with sporting and how do I help my kid help himself, you know, tell them like, write down questions you have in a notebook, bring that notebook to the meeting with the coach. Cause I know when I was a kid, I'd have like five questions I wanted to ask. I'd go in there. I'd be so nervous. I'd forget all of them. And I would just shake my head and I wouldn't really ask anything. So what I've told my guys the last 11 years is like, if you need to go talk to coach, you got problems or whatever's going on or, or whatever. First of all, you need to understand that you need to, you need to verbalize it in a way that isn't putting the coach on the defense. You don't go in and say, why am I not playing? Because right away that, that, you know, coach is going to be like on, on his heels. It's coach, what can I do to be better so I can help the team more? So I think, I think from a mentorship standpoint, you know, for the dads out there, that would be the first thing I would say to have your, your son or daughter ask their coach and then have a few questions written down on a notebook. Cause they're going to be nervous going in there and coaches aren't going to be mad. You brought in a notebook and then you can write down their answers. Cause you know, you're in that situation. It's like going to the principal's office. You're nervous. Maybe you don't remember everything they said this way. You can take down notes. And now when you leave there, you have actionable items to work on, you know, and why is this so important? whether you're on, you know, the house league team or the triple a team, why is this important later in life? Let's say they go to college. Are you going to be there to call their professor? What about their first job? Are you going to be there to talk to their bosses? No, you're not. These are lessons. Sports can be used as a metaphor for how to be successful in the rest of their life, which is why I love them so much. And I think especially hockey, because hockey has such a good culture and it's all, it's a very blue collar sport, no matter what. Uh, even though it costs a stupid amount of money to play, you have to have, yeah, it's gross. I hate it. Um, But you have to have a certain mindset to like keep going up in levels. And it's all about community and team and being a good leader, being a good follower. And all these lessons are going to make you successful, whether you play five more years, 10 more years, 30 more years, and you make millions of dollars, whatever it is, sports can make you a better member of society later on. I agree, man. And sports can also teach you a lot of life lessons. And when, especially when you get handed, you know, uh, you know, you, you get handed a hand that you're just like, man, wasn't expecting that, which happened to you. Yeah. 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 That's an understatement. Yeah. Tell us about that. 
Um, well, so I, I played at Western Michigan University. After my junior year, I signed in the NHL with the Boston Bruins. Um, so I left school after my third year. What what most players do uh, after they sign an NHL deal right after the season, like I did, is they go to the AHL for the NHL's team. So I was signed with the Bruins. I fly out to Boston, get my testing. I go down to Providence for their AHL team to finish the year. I did really, really well. Uh, I, I, I did wind up hitting a guy. I blew a guy up on the ice. Uh, not a big deal. And uh, I hurt my wrist a little bit. Like I, it wasn't feeling great. So I played the rest of the playoffs with a fractured wrist with the cast on whatever. I go home, find out that I had some cartilage torn. So I had to wear this like gunslinger thing for two months and uh, couldn't take it off. Had to sleep in it on my back. It was brutal. First day I get it off and I go to skate. I was skating in the old Hardy's Iceplex rink in the Chesterfield Valley. And I don't know if you ever skated there, but the uh, in the summer, because it's so hot in St. Louis and they didn't do a good job taking care of the rink, the ceiling would drip and there would be massive bubbles on the ice, like two to three inches tall. They're extremely dangerous. Like I look back and I shouldn't even been on. They shouldn't even let us on the ice with those things all over the ice. Like literally everyone knew they were there. I don't remember the morning that I went to skate, but apparently I was skating full speed down the ice. Like, and which is probably like 24 miles an hour. Um, and uh, I go to stop right in front of the boards and I hit one of those things, I guess. And I went head first into the boards, like complete freak accident. I, I was knocked unconscious. Uh, I lost at least 12 hours of my memory. I lost memories from the day before as well. Um, and uh, so I got a concussion and it wasn't my first. It was, you know, I, at that point, I don't know, it was probably like my fifth one at that point and uh, or sixth. And, you know, I'm just thinking, OK, I still have two months still training camp. I'll be OK, whatever. And just every day that went on, every week that on, it, it, it kept lingering. It didn't get better. NHL training camp comes supposed to be my first year of my first NHL contract. And I can't even participate like I can't even go to a grocery store for more than four minutes without almost throwing up, getting dizzy, getting lost in the grocery store. Um, it was, it was, it was, it was awful. I mean, I had all my dreams come true, everything I sacrificed for in college, you know, in juniors, my whole life put everything into being a hockey player, despite skating a lot, like happy Gilmore, not being the prettiest guy on the ice. And, uh, and you know, the rug kind of got pulled out from under me. Um, it, it was, it was very, very hard. I, I concussion protocols back then were a joke. It, it, I don't, it's nobody's fault. They just, they weren't taken care of like they are now. The, the old prescriptions were absolutely terrible. Um, but I was seeing doctors in Boston four to five days a week, every single week, neurologists doing acupuncture in my skull, like in my neck, in my spine, like vestibular rehab, because I'd close my eyes and I'd fall over. I had nightmares every night of my teeth falling out. So I'd sleep on the floor because my bed would be soaked if I woke up uh, in the middle of the night, literally every single night for like eight months. Um, I, I got approached by the insurance company like, hey, you got to make a decision here. Are you going to try and play again? And if you do, you'll never be covered for concussions again as a professional athlete. Um, so you'll never be able to like, if another one happens, you're not covered, like you're just done, or you can take this big insurance payout tax-free cash-free yada, yada, yada. And you can never play pro sports again. And I had worked so hard my whole life to get to that point that I was like, well, I at least have to try. Like, even if I only play one game, but I lose that insurance, like, I don't care. I have to try. Luckily after like a full, another year, full off season of uh, training and getting back to it. I was able to get back and play again um, for my second year of my contract. And uh, I won testing for the Bruins at NHL camp. And I got to play in five preseason NHL games after not playing hockey for a year and a half, which is like, that's, it's wild. Like they were doing stories on me left and right in Boston and on like, uh, you know, TV, like me playing after missing a year and all this stuff. Um, and, and so I come back and I get another concussion halfway through that year. I took a slap shot in the face and then I got a couple more. And I wound, so I wound up uh, finishing my career over in Europe, but I got to play nine years after that first bad concussion in the summer. Um, and, and it was a hard time, but this is where we talk about like, you know, youth sports and resiliency and all those hard times I went through and I was able to overcome up until I turned pro all of those things and learning how to deal with them helped me get over this really, really tragic thing that happened. Can I ask a personal question? Oh yeah. I'm open. How big book. was the, how big was the insurance check? Uh, it was, it was like, uh, 
I want to say like 450,000 tax free. And for me as a guy, 23 year old who had that, my first job was refing hockey. That's all I did up until that point. Um, and then my first real, real job was signing my NHL contract. So that's so, a lot of money. It's a lot of money for me to turn down. So let me get this straight. 23 years old. You had worst concussion of your life. Worst. Yep. Wor- what I would, that by far, I've interviewed a lot of pro athletes and I've interviewed pro athletes who have suffered from concussions. All the research I've ever done on concussions or anything like that. Yours by far, you and Mike Matheny, yours by far is the worst I've ever heard as far as like the, the severity and, and the, the, the rehab, the pathway back to nor- to, to being normal again. And for you to be 23 years old, because the first thing that entered my mind when you said that, the, that you could have this check and then you were like, I got to give it one more try. I was sitting there thinking like that check was probably like 10 grand, <laughs> no. 450 grand. You, yeah. you passed that. Like, let's, yeah. let's, Easily. let's sit on that for a second. I easily passed it. They asked me the question. I remember where I was when they asked it to me. I was in the hallway at the rink because they said what they said to me is actually a guy who used to play for the Blues. Name's Basil McRae. Um, I hit one of his his son, Phil, who played for the Blues from St. Louis. Uh, He was one of he's one of my clients when he was playing years later. Um, But I bought the my agent bought the insurance thing through Basil. And I remember being on the phone with Basil and being like, so what does this mean? And he was like, well, you get nine games from when you come back. Cause I was about to come back. And he's like, if you play that 10th game, you never, you can never be covered for concussions for the rest of your pro career. And you will never get paid out. If you stop, even if, if you play nine, ga- if you play that 10th game, one second, you dress, you can never again, be covered for concussions. And as somebody who had already had like six at that point, like that's like a, that's a worry, you know, Oh man, like future earnings versus, you know, this check and uh, you know, all these things. But I was like, I don't care, man. I I gave my whole life to this. I've got to try and see what happens. So I said, that's, that's okay. I'm, let's, let's go. <laughs> Dude, that that's, that's one of the craziest things I've ever heard in a, in a good way. Did your dad know about this? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. What oh, yeah. They, they knew. Um, I'm sure that I consulted with them about it. I'm sure I did. Um, but they knew me, they knew my heart. They knew that they knew all like, I, and I gave a speech at Lululemon here in St. Louis, like a month ago, I want to say. And, uh, and we were talking about like, um, investing in yourself and giving your all was kind of the topic of it. And, the speaker or the, the person who put it on Chelsea, who owns a bunch of burn boot camps in St. Louis, awesome person. She was like, so you sacrifice not going to parties and you sacrifice not going to dances. And I was like, well, I don't love that word. Cause that, that like, I get in one sense, quote unquote, I was sacrificing, but I was investing into myself. I didn't look at it like I sacrificed going out with my friends or I, I, oh, I'm sitting at home missing out. Like, no, I wanted to be home and go to bed early so I could wake up and train the next morning because I knew I, a, I had to do that. And B, I wanted to do that because I had a goal. I had a why that was extremely important to me and, and established. And every day I was living in a way that matched up with my why. So like it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a hard decision for me. I did all these things in the past to get to where I was, I, you know, whatever, if I played one game, I, that first game that I played in my first game back literally was in the NHL in the preseason in Toronto playing against the Maple Leafs, you know, the, the number one franchise in NHL history, all time, probably, you know, in their building, like if I got knocked out that game, I still would be happy. I made that decision. I wouldn't have cared it just for that, that, you know, I cried after the game. None of the guys saw me. I, I remember I, I, uh, I was sitting there in the locker room and I don't know if you follow hockey, but Patrice Bergeron, he's the Bruins captain. Now he's, he's unbelievable. He'll be a hall of fame NHL. And I remember looking around after the game and like, I think I was in my towel and I was like, I saw one of the uh, programs and obviously my name was in it because I played the game and like I looked around and I just kind of slid it in my bag, kind of embarrassed, didn't want anybody to see it. And he saw it and he actually went through a concussion where he missed a year also right after me. Um, And I looked up and I was like, 
kind of tears in my eyes that like, you know, I just played in this game and I'm, I feel like I'm okay. Maybe I can do this. I'm coming back. And, uh, and he, I catch eyes with him and I, I was like embarrassed. And he looked at me and he's like, I know you went through, man, you earned that, put that in your bag. And it was just so cool. Like I was like, yeah, man. And, and so everything was worth it. You know, I, if I had to do it all over again, even as shitty as it was, I would. Damn, dude. Yeah. I gotta tell you, man, that might be one of the most amazing and unexpected stories I've ever heard uh, for someone who's done professional sports. I appreciate I've never, it. I've never heard anything like that. And it, it just goes to show your heart was not on sale. No, oh, yeah, you know? never. never. Your heart, it, it just, that's just unreal to me, man. Yeah, um, thank you. You know, I want to, I want to relate this to the dads out there, right? I want to relate this to the dads out there. And this is not an insult for dads because I used to live in this camp as well, right? And the camp that I'm talking about is I'm, I'm about ready to release uh, my brand new book called the, the Pursuit of Legendary Fatherhood. And the first part of the book is basically the current state and what men are up against. One of the things that men are up against is what, what, what we call the drift. It's that wash, rinse, repeat. It's that every day is sort of the same going to a job that I, eh, it's okay. Mediocre marriage. Don't have the connection with my kids. That I truly, truly want, but I will tell you this in, in defense of men is they all want it. They all want it. The gap is, is how do I go get it? I'm not exactly sure what that looks like. Cause I, I, I honestly believe, you know, your dad was an anomaly and we're, we're seeing a generation of fathers now that really want more. They, they, they don't want to be just the provider. They want like this connection with their wives. They want this connection with their kids. They want to go to their grave. They, here's what they want. You want to know what they want? Let's they hear want, it. They want their sons and daughters to talk about their dad the way you do. That's what right. they want. Yeah. And because your dad was in it, you know, yep. he was, he was in it and that's what guys want. Now I will say this. A lot of guys will put their heart, they'll put that for sale sign on their heart. And what I mean by that is to life in general, life happens to me. I don't go out and manage life. I work in a job I hate because I'm trapped. That's just what I do. That's how I sacrifice as a dad. I have a mediocre marriage because, well, that's what marriage is supposed to be, right? Because it's supposed to be mediocre. I'm not supposed to have like this great relationship with my kids because, well, I didn't have that. So that's what it's supposed to be. And that's what I will, that's what I will challenge men in their thinking in the same way you did, where you're like, you know what? That sounds like the easy route to me. That 450 grand. Yeah, it sounds great, but it also sounds like the easy route. And that's not what I'm wired to do. What I'm wired to do is go do this and take a risk on myself and go lead this life that I've always wanted to lead. And I'm going to go try it out. And if it doesn't work out, at least I can say, you know what I had, I gave it everything I had and I left a shitload on the table to go get it, which mad respect for you got for you on that one. I just want to make sure the guys really hear that. So if you ever, if you ever thinking that way, you know, slide that $450,000 check, the, the one that, Hey, life manages me back across the table and go out and freaking grab life by the balls. That's what I'll say. I, I, I love that. And, and this is, I, I heard the, the, my junior coach, he was a very intense guy, very, very intense guy. Like I used to have to fist fight my teammates all the time, like for real, like real fights on, on the ice. Obviously hockey was different back then. Guys would be, guys would be a minute early. Wasn't early enough. Walk in the locker room to the captains. Hey, take care of it. Go out on the ice before practice. And I was a very skinny kid, by the way, like I'm yoked now. I'm an animal now. I did not used to be. I was super skinny, super weak. Again, I had to find a way. And that's falling in love with the gym is the reason I was able to do all these things. Um, but I'd have to go out there and fight my teammates who were way tougher than me um, because that that's just what was required. But it was. Uh, it, <sighs> He had this saying where you don't want to be the guy at 30 years old, looking back saying, I wish I would have done blank. And that is, that has been one of the 
most powerful sentences, phrases, whatever, to me in my life, in my career as both a hockey player, um, as a strength coach, as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, as a motivational speaker, like all of these things, it's everything. Like I, I wish more people would think that way. Like I, I, you know, that saying was so popular around like when, we, when I was graduating college, like YOLO, people used it in terms of like partying. You only live once, you only live once, go to that party. And like, yeah, I, I believe in that. Like you got to have fun with your life. But I looked at it from like a, 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 a career standpoint, YOLO, you only live once. So when I talk to all of my guys and all these teams I work with, it's like your hockey career is this long. If you live to be a hundred and you play college elite hockey college, that's four years, four years out of a hundred. And if you get to play pro, like a long pro career is probably like seven, eight years, you know, 10 years, obviously very long. Like that's still only 12 years out of your whole hundred year life. Like if you really care about this, do everything you can to maximize your abilities and see where the cards fall. And then you'll look back and you'll have no regrets. And even more importantly, on top of that, by living in that way, you will learn how to do so many things that you didn't want to do. Like my dad, like he got home. He, okay. Like I got home at 7 PM. I worked all night. I woke up at four, something broke. I don't know how to fix it. I'm going to figure it out. He just did it. And like in my life, that's what happened. A roadblock comes up. I have to find a way around this because I don't want to be 40 years old looking back saying, man, why didn't I reach out for help? Or why didn't I try to get over that hump? Why didn't I try to do something around that injury? And that's how I teach all my guys the importance of finding a way and giving your all because hockey will end one day football for your son it'll end one day but like we said earlier all these lessons of learning how to overcome obstacles and if a door gets shut you find a way to kick in a freaking window somewhere else in that house to get in when you force yourself to do that stuff you're learning these skills these adaptability skills these overcoming skills that whenever a problem arises later in your life in business relationships whatever you're going to be more equipped and have more tools in your toolbox to uh overcome those those challenges and so like that's a big thing i think that that parents can help shepherd their kids through youth sports without overstepping and like figuring out all the problems for them and i'm sure it's hard like i said i don't have kids you, you have four you said so like i think the challenge is taking a breath as a dad when a problem happens your son comes i'm not playing he's crying whatever he's upset pause yourself and be like okay what is this problem? How is this going to rise in the rest of his life? What would I tell him if he was 30? What would I tell him if he was 40? What would I tell him in college if this was a professor? What does he need to do now so that in college talking to a professor or at his first job, or if he's a boss and he's in a similar situation, what skills would he need to know then that I can help him guide him to work on now that's going to help him in his future. And I think that's really, really important. And it takes a little bit of like reflection and thinking about it before just getting hot and calling the coach and being like, why isn't Johnny playing, you know, but it's going to serve your son or daughter for the rest of their life. Yeah. I totally agree with that, man. It's like, you need to give your kids a little bit of the battle plan guidance before you go out and just, you know, draw your sword and shield and go fight it for them. You know? Right. Right. You know, as we wrap up here, cause I know one of the last segments we wanted to talk about was to give the men and parents just some marching orders. And man, we've had some incredible athletes come on the podcast and talk about just some pointers on basically like, you know, unfortunately the biggest enemy when it comes to our kids sports performance is us, you know, we're the ones who are, I can't even tell you how many pro athletes have said, good things and not so good things about the car ride home from little league, you know, being in the back seat and you're like, Oh shit, I know it's coming. Um, or, you know, the certain things that their, their dad did or didn't do, but, um, you work with these youth athletes, hundreds of them a week. I, I would love for you to give the, the men who listen to the show, some really poignant, very simple things very, some, some guardrails on what they should be doing, what they shouldn't be doing, talks they should be having, talks that they should stay out of. I think we gave some really good context around how you need to approach the coaches, but let's talk about the interactions between the dad and the kids. 
Yeah. The car ride home. That's something we, so we have, we have like, uh, you know, hall of famers on our podcast. We have coaches, we have guys who had good careers. We have guys who didn't have good careers who were really good when they were younger. And we, one of our favorite things is to ask is what did your dad say on the car ride home to you? We always ask that because yeah. we love that. You know, it's, it's really important. And, uh, w- w- our ideal situation, we found like most of those elite level players, um, their experience the most was instead of talking about their your child's play more asking about effort like things that they can control that they can control whether it's sports or school or life or business so more like how do you think you played not so more asking them questions and then if your son or daughter wants to talk about it, then you go from there. But you know, it's the parents who, when the kid gets in the car and the kid does not want to get in the car, cause they know mom or dad, it's usually dad is just going to come down on them. Why didn't you do this? Or why didn't you do that? Or did you see this? You know, that is literally the fastest way to a hurt your relationship with your son or daughter. Like 100%. I've seen this so many times, so many times. It's really hard to watch. Um, it's not what you, I know you think you're helping them. You're not, you're not, it's not helping them. It's, it's hurting their psyche. It's making them less confident because now when they're on the ice or the field, they're thinking when they mess up or whatever, what's dad going to say after the game. And that is the furthest thing that's going to help a player be better at their sport. Um, so it's more asking questions. How do you think you played? Did, did you play hard today? Did you, did you give all of everything you had? Were you a good teammate? You know, were you, were you supportive of the boys in the locker room and on the bench and things like that? So it's way more of like the, the intangibles than the actual outcome. Right. I think that's really important because then you're also constantly by asking, did you work as hard as you could today? Did you have fun? That's a big one. Youth sports are youth sports. They're for children. They're not to keep. I want to keep score. I don't believe in participation trophies. I believe in keeping score. I believe in learning to lose and learning to win both of them. But it, as a parent, you can't like drive your kid crazy because they lost or, or anything like that. That's, that's beyond the point. So it's more like, what was your effort? Did you enjoy it? Did you have fun? And, and if they didn't work hard, then ask more questions. Well, why, why didn't you work your hardest? Well, what if, what if dad was at his job and he only worked like 50%, we're not eating to this week, <laughs> you know, like, so, so more, more like things like that and, and just having fun with your kid and, and seeing where they take it because you can have so many unbelievable times with your son or daughter when they're playing sports, if you're having fun with it and and you can do it the right way. And it, it's just, I see so many parents that, that go crazy with it. The stats are most overwhelming majority are not going to play pro sports. Overwhelming majority. Right. That doesn't mean you don't try for it. And that's not a goal. That's okay. You have that goal, but remember that these are, you can use all these times to bond with your son or daughter, right? To have fun with them, to have something for the rest of your life. You can do with them, enjoy together, going to games in professional sports, all these things on top of the most important, I think is teaching the life lessons baked into hockey hidden in those metaphors or whatever sport. Man, I so agree with everything you just said. You know, we've had, um, had a Navy SEAL who came on the podcast. This was years ago. We talked about the difference between a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. And one of the, one of the examples that he used was you can actually train your youth athlete to have a growth mindset over a fixed. And, and the easiest way to do that is focus on their effort and their work ethic and not their performance. Absolutely. And, when I first heard that, I mean, this was years and years ago. It was like seven. This is like when the podcast was in infancy stage. And I was like, wasn't well, performance kind of everything? Like that was kind of my thinking back then. I had little bitty kids back then. And he's like, no, he's like, it's not. He's like, you know, if you look at Carol Dweck's work, you know, and grit and work ethic and all these things, the people that move the needle are not necessarily the highest performers. It's the ones who, re- who refuse to give up and the ones who constantly stay disciplined to the process and have the work ethic. And I really dove into that work. And then I was just like, holy crap, this is so freaking true. And here's the interesting thing. I do not, I, for, for years and years and years now, I have, I do not coach my kids from the stands. I don't say anything. Thank God. But yeah. I, I might clap, you know, that's, that's about it. But uh, dude, there's this one guy, I, I kid you not. And you could tell, so my, my six-year-old plays six, you learn to play soccer. 
learn to play. It's not even real games, dude. Right. Okay. Well, let's get that straight. It's right. It's at Veta. You know where Veta is at. Dude, this guy, I kid you not. So like it's 25 minutes of fun drills and then it's 25 minutes of a scrimmage. That's what these kids do every Sunday. There is this dude, man. I kid you not. You can tell by his build and the way he is. He's He was like probably the man playing soccer growing up, right? This dude doesn't stay on the bench. He goes down on the field oh, and God. he coaches his kid oh. on the sidelines while the coaches are out there trying to do instructional play. Mm. And I'm like, do you have any idea what you're doing? Like Handicapping that kid. Oh, yeah. And then the, the last game that the kids were at, his kid didn't want to play anymore. And you could tell the Weird. dad. For, right? right? And Weird. The dad was just pissed. Took his kid aside. He's like, what's going on? What's wrong with you? This is not what we do at home. Like, come on. Like, And the kid was just crying. And he was just like, I don't want to play. I don't want to play. And decent player too. And um, it was just really sad to see because I'm sitting there thinking, even my wife was like, what do you think happened? And I was like, I think dad has gotten way too many reps in on this kid's ear. I think that's what's happened. You're and probably at home and probably at home going and being like, let's go practice instead of practicing when the kid wants you to practice. The goal is to to empower them to invest in themselves. And obviously it's six. The words you use to to help shape that work ethic is different than like invest in yourself. You know, it's like, oh, you know, I like to point out the good examples. I believe in positive reinforcement more often than negative reinforcement. Obviously there's times for both, but I found, especially when I used to train the younger players, instead of in a room of younger players coming down on the kids who are there to have fun and not work hard and yada, 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 and not paying attention. Instead of doing that, I look at the one or two kids who are just beasting through everything and just praise them. Well, guess what? Guess what all these kids now want? They want that praise to be like little Johnny, man, Johnny's killing it. Johnny, you remind me of the NHL players that I work with in the mornings, blah, 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 working this hard. Well, now all these kids want to do that too. So just by that kind of mind, sh- mind mindset shift in my coaching and, and praising the, the good stuff. Now all the other kids want to do the good stuff. Now they think it's cool to work hard. Yeah, that's all you had to do. Find a way to make it cool to work hard. And that's the goal with you sports. It's not you're not winning a championship at six. You're not getting a pro contract at seven. You're not getting a scholarship at 10. All right. You build these habits and these 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 different like base level of the pyramid. And then as they go up, all of that foundation will will wind up carrying them through if it's something that they want to do. And if it's not. I'm sure most dads, when their kids are born, they're not like, I'm not going to like that baby if they don't play pro soccer. <laughs> you know, that's not the thought, the first thought in their head. So I think that's something to keep in mind the whole time. Agreed, man. Dude, this has been so enjoyable. This has been a lot of fun uh, and a lot of good content came out of this podcast. I want to make sure that the audience that wants to connect with you, I know you obviously run a business that helps youth athletes obviously perform better. You know, you've got a podcast. Uh, where can the men find you, follow you, uh, contact you if they want to? Yeah, I just tell everybody to go to my Instagram. It's just my name at Jeff Lavecchio, blue check mark, missing tooth, hot guy, pretty easy to find. Um, I just use <laughs> and I <laughs> and I just I just use my Instagram. Honestly, it, it's main it, it's geared a little bit more towards hockey, but it's also geared a lot towards a general population of people who want to be healthier in mind and body. Uh, When I was growing up, I'm sure it was the same for you. The way that I was trained in the gym did a lot to hurt my body, not help my body be a better athlete. Um, I learned so much over my career uh, and in school studying exercise science as well that I love teaching people to use the gym in a smarter way to help them just perform better in life, in sports, whatever it may be in hockey. So if you have any questions on that stuff, just hit me up on Instagram at Jeff Lavecchio. My podcast with my cousin is called the hockey think tank podcast. Well, guys, not to worry. We're going to have all of Jeff's links in the show notes for you. You don't have to worry about how to spell his last name either. You know, it's L O V E C C H I O. So not to worry. We'll have it in the show notes for you. Go to the dadedge.com forward slash 396 for this show. Again, the dadedge.com forward slash 396 for this show. Jeff, this was, this was freaking awesome, man. Like, I, I know we're, it, man. dude, we're, we're recording this on a Friday. 
And I just want to go out and like conquer the world right now. <laughs> that's, that's always my goal. When I come on these is, is bring, bring the energy. I'm going to the gym after this. I just want to say, man, if you and your son want to come into the gym sometime here, uh, all my pro guys are now gone for NHL camps. Uh, I don't work as much during the hockey season. So if you want to come in, hit me up. I'll, I'll take you guys through a session and teach you both some stuff that'll help you perform better. I would love to, man. My yeah. boys, they, all of them. Love Bring them all in, man. Yeah, yeah of course. hundred percent. All of fitness. We actually, even as a family, we, I mean, even, <laughs> even my eight year old this past year, bless his heart, got in on the Murph. Like we all do the Murph together and savages. Uh, my two older boys, man, they can blow right through it. I mean, even my eight year old, he's like, I want to get out there. I was like, ah, you're a little small. He's like, I want to get out there and just try. And, and I was like, well, I'm, I'm all about trying. Let's just see what you got. And that boy, I, I mean, he basically did a friend. Wow. You know, he, he did like a half Murph. And of course I had to help him with the pull-ups and all that. Yeah, He's out there doing his little push-ups and his squats and he jogged with us. And, and, and it's because you're leading the way and his brothers are leading the way to bring it full circle. Like we talked about at the beginning of the podcast. That's so yeah, cool. What ta- uh, caught, not taught. There you go. Not taught. That's I'm right. using it. I'm stealing it, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you the citation every time I use it. <laughs> Love it, man. Love it. Guys, like we said, head on over to the dadedge.com forward slash three, nine, six for this show. And above all else, gentlemen, go out, live legendary. Take care.